I'm with Francis West. We're at the International Labour Office here in Geneva for the Global Business Disability Network. It's the 100th year of the ILO, and we're celebrating with a conference about the future of work inclusive of persons with disability. You've just finished a panel on AI and inclusion in work. What were your takeaways from that panel? Well, first, I think it's very exciting to see the uh, topic of AI and also the future of work on the agenda. And also, in the audience, we actually have a lot of organizations, including, for example, the World Economic Forum. We also have OECD there. Um, I think the fact that uh, we're talking about disability in the future of work context with so many global organizations here, uh, not just uh, talking but discussing what are the impact and what are the things we need to do collectively is a very very encouraging sign yeah i i, I think that it's it's great to see so many people convened in one space definitely a change of pace from from previous years and we're seeing more organizations really good to see uh, organizations from uh, China as well, getting engaged. So Huawei are here talking about what they're doing around AI and inclusion. I think that's really important that we're not too Euro or US centric in our approach to, to accessibility, because if we want to include everyone, it needs to be everyone and everyone needs to be part of the, the play here. And I think that also, I think for me, my takeaway was around the cultural biases as well as the disability biases. Uh, so it was a telling moment for me when the member of the audience came and said, actually, we turned the AI off in our recruiting platform right. because it doesn't look for African uh, characteristics. Those kind of nuances of how we interact and how we hold ourselves are different from the Europeans. So uh, the whole machine learning piece, we need better data sets and to find better ways of training AI so that we don't exclude persons with disabilities. So if you were to say uh, what's the main thing that is exciting you about the potential of AI for inclusion, what would it be? Well, I think the, um, like we talked about uh, earlier, the, oh, by the way, going back to your point about the takeaway, I mean, the fact that the ILO organization, uh, this, is, this is probably the third or fourth time I've attended uh, the ILO, and historically, actually, a lot of discussion about policy and the fact that the technology is front and center uh, of this particular event is, is very exciting for those of us. Yes. Both of us are in the technology business to be actually um, invited to discuss this is, is very exciting. And, and yet, at the same time, we as a technology, both of us understand that uh, the future of AI actually is going to be very important that we bring the human back into the discussion. So the fact that we actually have a lot of uh, uh, what, we, what I call the human first uh, thinkers and the collaborator in the audience makes the AI uh, discussion uh, that much more uh, uh, impactful, I think. Um, personally, I think AI is going to be a, a, a um, revolutionary uh, technology and that the fact that AI will be able to um, be, be trained and to, uh, to really focus on individual nuances, I think it's an area where we potentially have a lot of opportunity. That, of course, is given that people in designing the AI logic and also the data set that's going to go into machine learning will have or needs to have the uh, human participation from the get-go. If we do that, I think the, the future is incredible. Frankly, I feel like the AI single-handedly can begin to narrow the gap between the people with disability and without disability. There's huge potential and I think if we use AI to do the more mundane tasks, actually what it's giving us is the potential to free up our creative selves. So, Absolutely. So thank you very much, Francis. This is Francis West, uh, author of Authentic Inclusion, former Chief Accessibility of IBM, and now CEO of FWESCO. Thank you. I'm here with Eleanor Locarno from WPI. How have you found the conference so far? I've really enjoyed it. I think I've heard some really great conversations, discussions, the panels have been awesome. Really enjoyed myself. There's been a lot of talk around uh, AI and, and bias and unconscious bias. Uh, I know that you're from an academic background. We've heard a lot from business. So, so 
what are the things that you've been thinking about and, and working on recently? Yeah, so I think the conference has been really helpful for me in terms of looking at how we need to train our students who are going into the workforce. So the idea of the ethics and looking at, you know, we have data, what are the issues surrounding that? Are people, you know, is, are, are we all represented in that data? Are there some people missing from the data? Um, those, those are some of the things that I've been thinking I need to take back to the classroom. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, as we look around us at this conference, we haven't got many young people here. And the accessibility profession is getting older. We need to be bringing people in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'd, I'd like to think that we can start including some of this stuff in standard education as well as Absolutely. sort of creating specialists. So uh, do you think that this is something that, that academia is, is prepared for? I think, I think they're, they're starting. I mean, there's people like me. I, I have some other colleagues who are looking at um, working on projects where you're bringing students in. So I have a lot of projects, projects back at the university with students who are doing just this. They're working on collecting data or creating apps for people with disabilities. Um, and so I think you know it, it's the responsibility of us to kind of bring students in and, and expose them to it. So when they get to the organization, they have a context and they are not going to just let their managers go without thinking about it, right? If you're going to, if you learn how to design a network, or excuse me, if you learn how to design a user interface in school and you have accessibility guidelines that you're following, when you go out into the workforce, it's not going to be something you have to learn. It's no. going to be something you just come with those tools. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Neil here, I'm still in Geneva. Uh, we're at the ILO and I'm here with Brendan Roach of the Business Disability Forum. Brendan, you've been leading a lot of the work on internationalization of our uh, maturity models over the last few years and it's been a pleasure to work with you. What's been the stuff that you've taken away from this conference? Do you think that, uh, that more companies are really getting to grips with the idea that they need a framework? Yeah, absolutely. Um... I've been coming to this conference for the last four or five years now, so absolutely I've seen uh, the attendance grow and grow and grow, so clearly more global organisations are realising that the potential they have to make an impact, a positive impact on the lives of people with disabilities is vast given that many of the businesses here have presence in 50 countries, 100 countries, 150 countries, depending on, on, on the company, so uh, what we're seeing now is actually uh, moving from a commitment and ambition to do better across global operations to actually starting to think about well how do we actually operationalize that and turn that commitment into tangible outcomes yeah brilliant and I, I think that's that's the the art of it we, we've got to be thinking about how we can do this systemically yeah yeah, and that's where the frameworks that we've been developing together with, with yes. Atos, with you and the other members of our Global Task Force, you know, that's really the intention behind those types of yeah. tools. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Great. <laughs> I'm here with Megan Horsfeld, who is the DNI lead for Sodexo UK. Uh, you were a part of the panel that I was on this morning around uh, mental health and neurodiversity in the workplace. It certainly was. How has your conference been so far? been amazing there's such a great collection of people here and so many interesting conversations happening about uh, disability inclusion whether it's in the private or the public sector so fantastic brilliant event I'm so glad to have been here yeah um, so what are the, the sort of key things that you've taken away there's been lots of talk of uh, artificial intelligence machine learning uh, bias in and ethics but also about working together what are the the things that you want to take away and, and, and bring back to Sodexo so I think the thing that I've loved about this conference is it hasn't been about ILO, it hasn't about been about BDF, it hasn't been about all of the other disability organisations working in silos, it's been about how do we all collaborate together so as human beings and I've really enjoyed that, that theme has run throughout the whole conference. So it's been very much around, you know, how do we adapt to technology but how do we also influence it um, and people who know me will know that I'm a bit of a technophobe um, so I've also really loved some of the really practical examples and discussions that have come out about how do we just encourage people to open up conversations about disability and in particularly mental health. Thank you very much. It's Neil Milliken here. I'm still in Geneva at the ILO 100th anniversary uh, GBDN, Global Business Disability Network conference. We're talking about an inclusive future of work. I'm here with David Lysett. David, 
what's been the thing that struck you most about the, the conference so far? Um, so far, I am struck by the new concept that I am subscribed to, coming, back, coming from a disability, but also a business economic background. And instead of just a white face approach, we are also looking at an economic and fitness uh, case approach to employing people with disability. And I think that is crucial. Ab uh, absolutely. I uh, couldn't agree more. I, I think that what we have with disability and aging, we've got this mega trend. Mm. You know, populations are getting older. We acquire disabilities as we age. Yeah. Uh, and we were here <coughs> and we had the World Economic Forum here. We had World Bank here. Yes. You know, this is, you know, a macroeconomic issue. Definitely, definitely. And it's going to affect so many different applications of life from climate change, from um, resources, from incomes, taxation. So we need to look at it from an economic point of view. Um, and I know in some sectors of the social sector that's not popular, but we need to get past that. Yeah. So I think whilst we value the contributions of, yeah. of including individuals, we need to go up several levels to take this kind of helicopter view exactly. so, that, so that we can bring these economic issues to bear and, and, and bring these things together. Because you're right, it's, it's about more than individuals. It's our collective uh, well-being as societies that we're talking about. Definitely. And um, for Rick that said, <clears throat> I think one of the major stumbling blocks is we have the private sector and the, um, on one side and the social NGO on the other side and we don't know how to talk to each other and we need to learn a common language. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you very much. I'm here with Marcy Ross, who is the new Executive Director and CEO of World Institute on Disability, which Deborah and I have the pleasure to sit on the board of. Marcy, it's the first time we've met in person. We've only done it online before. Great to actually meet you in the flesh here in Geneva. What have been the things that have impressed you most about the conference so far or made the biggest impression? This has been a fabulous conference, in part because I've had an opportunity to spend time with you and Deborah and Francis and so many other people. Um, I think what has impressed me most is the fact that there is a global collaboration of people who are focusing on not just that inclusion is important, but talking about how we work together to get it done. And unless that conversation continues, we will continue to admire the problem of the underemployment of people with disabilities. Your session, your most recent session, you've had several sessions, but your most recent session today where you focused on practical suggestions for how simple efforts can make it possible for people to be successful in the workplace, most importantly by including them in the conversation uh, and making things as simple and logical as possible. That's a win-win. Yeah. It's a win for people with disabilities. It's a win for employers because when people find things simply, when they can do their job without a whole lot of distraction, it's gonna benefit the individual. That's productivity, right? Exactly and right. Business loves productivity. Exactly right. Yeah, so disability inclusion is good for business. Exactly you heard it here. Exactly right. Thank you very much, Marcy. Hi, it's Neil Millican here. I'm at the ILO in Geneva. We're here for the Future of Work Inclusive of Disabilities Conference. I'm here with Andy Garrett from GSK. Um, it's great to see so many large organizations here. What have been your key takeaways from the last couple of days of uh, talks and lectures? Well, there's a couple of points I'd really like to make. Uh, you know, we've talked a bit about the technology revolution 
and, and AI in particular. And whilst technology can be enabling, yeah, if, we, if it's not done carefully, it risks leaving some people behind. And we need to, to ensure that as we're developing and working with AI that we don't allow those algorithms to unconsciously or even perhaps consciously exclude. So that's one key thing. Uh, and the point that was made in one of the sessions just now about the future of work not being, being predetermined, you know, we, uh, we, we should be investing in shaping the future and not just responding to it. Yeah? And then when we're investing in that, it's making sure that what we're doing is inclusive of everyone because that adds to our diversity and our productivity. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm here with Yasmin Laroche, who's the Deputy Minister for Public Service Accessibility. Yasmin, it's been a great conference so far. What have been your, your key things, your learning points? Wow, that's a tough question. My key learning points have been the importance of networks and partnerships because so many people are doing really great work in this space now. We can learn a lot from each other. Um, the vital importance of including people with disabilities, so nothing without us. That really came through a lot. Uh, this, that business and government and uh, the labor movement should all be working together to advance this. So lots of learning. It, yeah, it needs to be a partnership. We need to collaborate. Yes, we really do. And uh, I heard an inspiring uh, wrap up of a session about how technology can be a force for good, but we need to help them get there. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's been uh, great to see you again. It's been great to see you too, Neil. Bye-bye. Bye. So I'm here with Kate Nash. Kate is the Purple Space Purple Champion, Purple Leader, the network, Purple Space being the network of employee disability networks. Great to have you here as the uh, Purple Champion of uh, the ILO GBDN. How have you found the last couple of days? <gasps> I've loved it. Neil, I have loved it every single second. It's like a little global village. You know, all of these individuals, amazing names, incredible change agents that are working quietly away. And you know them and you talk to them and you speak by email. And yet, you, they all come to life. Apparently, they're all real. So yeah, I've loved it. I've learned lots. I've made great connections. I have been reintroduced to wonderful friends and loved ones. And yeah, it's been great. Back next year, hopefully. Steph, do it again. Oh, definitely. And um, come every year, you know, come for the chocolate, come for the company, come for the learning. Um, but also, what, what's your key learning takeaway from, from the event? Oh, it's about collaboration. You know, it's something that we all know and we all work to. But you kind of refresh yourself. You're reminded about the power of collective. And I think there's a real tipping point. Now is our time. So, yeah, I think the takeaway for me is just to keep energy high and to keep going um, and to not get disenchanted. So, yeah, it's to keep going. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. See you on the Purple Airways on the 3rd of December. Bye. Bye. Hi, Neil Milken here. We're at the ILO GBDN Future of Work Inclusive of Disabilities Conference. I'm here with Dennis Heathfield, who is the representative from Cummings, which is a large US manufacturing organization. Indeed, yeah, we're a global company, uh, number 124, I think, on the Fortune 500 list. Uh, we've got 65, roughly 65,000 employees. About half of those are outside of the United States. Um, yeah, and we're just, uh, just really getting started on our, our disability inclusion strategy, and I've I've had a great time. It's my first GBDN conference, and I've learned learned a ton. Yeah. So, um, lots of people have been talking about the importance of networking and and companies working together and having some kind of systemic frameworks. The other big topic was AI. What were what were your key takeaways uh, from the last couple of days? Yeah, I think um, first first of all. Um, being new to, to this role, I've been, I've been in my role, I've been with Cummins for 25 years, but in this role leading our disability inclusion work for just about the last year. And um, I've, I've, um, I've spent a lot of time on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, and so I've, I've come to know some of the, some of the more prominent people that are, that are active in this space. Yeah. Uh, and so getting a chance to meet them um, in person, as well as um, a number of contacts at companies that have been recommended for best practices for things like workplace adjustments and so forth. Uh, getting to meet, meet people in real time and forge, forge a personal relationship I think has been really beneficial. Um, I really enjoyed the session um, um, that, and, um, 
um, the ERG networks. Uh, we actually have pretty strong uh, ERG networks, not just for disability inclusion, but for other dimensions of diversity as well, but walked away with some really good ideas <clears throat> on how to strengthen, um, strengthen our ERG networks. And one idea in particular is to do a better job of looking at, at those networks as places to, to, to grow uh, future, future talent. Um, one of the areas where, where we feel like, and I think a lot of companies are in the same place where we have a, a lot of uh, improvement to make is how we talk about mental health in our, in our workplace. And so the, the session this morning I, I found to be, um, again, really helpful. Just, um, just the examples of what other companies are doing with their mental health ally networks and uh, how they're communicating, the importance of having leadership engagement. Um, um, so, you know, yeah. really just a, just a ton of good information yeah. as, in addition to the contacts. It, it's great to be sharing with people and I think that, that that uh, those real life examples and uh, the you know, seeing how other organizations are doing it, getting to touch and feel of it is, is really super important and one of the great benefits of conferences like these. Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you, Neil. Appreciate it.